Okay, folks, uh, welcome to the Physics Colloquium. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Katie Bauman. Uh, Katie completed her undergraduate degree in electrical engineering in the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, before completing her MS and PhD in electrical engineering and computer science at MIT. Uh, she spent the following two years as a postdoc in, at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for, Astro for Astrophysics before coming to Caltech as an assistant professor in June 2019. She has a joint appointment in the Department of Computing and Mathematical Sciences and the Department of Electrical Engineering. And as of recently, she also has a courtesy appointment in the PMA. She's also a Rosenberg Scholar. So Katie's research is focused on inverse problems uh, and machine learning applications within computational imaging and video processing. The applications are broad with potential impact across a, a wide range of research, in, including that at Caltech, ranging from astronomical imaging to seismology. Uh, this is why she has a joint appointment in CMS, NEE, and a courtesy appointment at PMA. Uh, a significant fraction of Katie's research to date has been centered on interchromatic imaging in astronomy, which is a difficult inverse problem. And Katie has chosen probably the most difficult and uh, technically challenging example of that uh, in the form of the EHT, the Event Horizon Telescope, which is a worldwide uh, array of telescopes that focuses on, on imaging at the most exquisite resolution we can do from the, from the ground or space uh, in the effort to detect or to resolve the event horizon of supermassive black holes. Um, Katie jointly coordinates a working group on imaging within the EHT collaboration with focus on development of novel algorithms for, for imagery construction. This includes developing new algorithms herself, including uh, one that she leads called CHIRP, but also um, evaluating other, other algorithms for imagery construction, essentially be, being the arbiter of com and comparing all algorithms that are used for reconstruction, um, for sky, sky reconstruction within EHT. And this effort has, has impact across all pipelines within EHD. Uh, Katie also leads uh, Caltech's participation in the Next Generation EHT project, which is a very exciting multi-million development effort um, that tries to architect and design the next version of EHT in the next decade. And that will not just make images, but will try to dynamically image the complex environment of the supermassive black hole in our own galaxy. Um, and you'll hear all about that very shortly. I want to also mention that this week, Katie was selected to receive the Graduate Student Council Teaching Award. So congrats, Katie. And without further, further ado, I'll hand it over to Katie. Well, thank you, Greg, for the really kind introduction. And uh, thank you for inviting me today. So I had the opportunity earlier today to talk with some uh, of the PMA grad students, uh, which was great. And I wish I could meet all these new names I see in the chat in person, but hopefully uh, we'll all be back in campus in not too, too long and I'll get a chance to meet and uh, work with a number of you then. So um, as uh, Greg said today, I'm gonna talk uh, to you all about imaging black holes. And um, black holes you know, are one of the most mysterious phenomena we uh, in the universe and scientists have been studying them ever since they were first predicted by Einstein's theory, from Einstein's theory of general relativity just over hundred years ago. And in particular, for decades, scientists have been studying the giant elliptical galaxy that's at the head of the Virgo constellation. So this galaxy uh, called M87 is uh, 55 million light years away from us and very special because over 100 years ago, someone actually discovered the streak of light on the sky, which ended up being a galactic scale jet of plasma that was shooting out of the core of the galaxy and essentially marking the spot of a supermassive black hole. And so over decades, scientists tried to develop better and better instruments to study the supermassive black hole predicted to be at the center. And then in April of 2017, we hooked up this Earth-sized telescope and collected the data necessary to make uh, the very first picture of a black hole. And this is what we saw two years later after processing the data. So this black hole image uh, required an international collaboration of scientists from all around the world, building new instruments, new algorithms, uh, working together across uh, different countries uh, to make it possible. And so today I want to tell you a very abridged story of how we were able to capture a picture of a black hole. There are many angles to this story, so I hope to give you a glimpse into kind of my more uh, contribution to the story, which is how imaging was done and validated. And then in the second half of the talk, I'm going to talk more about current, uh, about techniques that are currently being developed in my group at Caltech to push the event horizon past its current limits to see things that are still currently invisible to us. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about how we're developing new machine learning approaches for developing, for doing uncertainty quantification 
as well as how we're developed uh, the methods to optimize the placement of the next telescopes we build into the earth size telescope array. Okay, so before we can begin, the first question you might ask is how are we able to take an image of a black hole that, you know, by definition doesn't let light escape? It, it you know, should be unseeable. Well, light propagating near a black hole doesn't follow straight lines. It's curved because the black hole is curving space time. And so photons can even go in complete circles around it. And so the space around the black hole is lit up by this hot gas that is uh, spinning around. It's actually heated to hundreds of billions of degrees. And so we have all these photons flying around everywhere. And some of these photons fall into the black holes, but other ones just graze it and are bent by its uh, gravitational pull, causing the net effect to be that the black hole essentially casts a shadow on the bright surrounding emission, cr creating this ring that's almost perfectly circular. And if Einstein was right about general relativity, this light would be bent into a ring whose size and shape tell us about the mass and the spin of the black hole. And this ring is often referred to as the black hole shadow. So it's kind of like we're seeing the imprint of the black hole on all the surrounding uh, stuff that is going around. Um, so here is a more realistic simulation of what we would expect to see if we had a uh, really high resolution and we could see it around a one millimeter wavelength. Okay, um, so at first you know, glance, uh, this ring, taking this picture, even if we can get this imprint, taking this picture actually still seems nearly impossible. And that's because the size of this ring is incredibly small. It's about 40 micro arc seconds in size, which is about the same size as a grain of sand. But if that grain of sand is in New York and I'm viewing it from here at Caltech. And so taking a picture of, of something that small is really, really difficult. And it all comes down uh, just to the limits of diffraction. And what, you know, what diffraction says is if we plug in the wavelength uh, of light that we need to see and the required angular resolution we need to see that black hole shadow into the diffraction limit equation, you can just like easily calculate that in order to see that ring of light around the event horizon, we need a telescope that's 13 million meters across or essentially the size of the Earth. And if we could build an Earth sized telescope, we could just start to make out that distinctive ring of light that's indicative of the black holes, uh, the black hole and its event horizon. So although building a single dish telescope the size of the Earth isn't possible, by joining telescopes located around the world, I've been working as part of an international uh, collaboration called the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration that built a computational telescope the size of the Earth that's capable of resolving structure on the scale of a black hole's event horizon for the first time. And joining telescopes in this manner is called Very Long Baseline Interferometry, um, or VLBI. And so how does uh, VLBI work? How does the EHT work? Well, the, event, the EHT, Event Horizon Telescope, is composed of telescopes from around the world that were actually originally built for other purposes. So, but by installing specialized equipment in each of the sites and linking the signals through uh, the precise timing of, for instance, of atomic clocks, we've been able to make these originally disjoint telescopes actually work together. And so teams of researchers at each of the sites, they travel to the sites and then we essentially freeze light by recording petabytes of data and then we bring that data together and our computers process the data acting like the lens to make the picture. So how do you make a picture then with this computational telescope? Well, unlike with a camera in the Event Horizon Telescope, we don't capture the picture in pixel space, but instead in frequency space. So we essentially take measurements of the black hole images Hoyer transform. And if we put telescopes all across the globe, we would sample all these spatial frequency measurements, uh, but because we only have a telescope at a few locations, that means we only get a sparse number of measurements. And so it turns out that for every two telescopes in the telescope array, we obtain a single complex measurement of the underlying image's 2D spatial frequency related to the projected baseline between the telescopes, okay? Each of these measurements, so this is a point, this is a frequency component we're measuring of the image, so that means it's a complex number. So it's described by two numbers, the amplitude and phase, which well, will come in handy to remember later. Okay, so in 2017 though, the Event Horizon Telescope observed with eight different telescopes, but actually only five of them were able to see M87 or were at different locations. 
distinct locations. So that means we would only be able to choose a sample five to choose two, which is only 10 points, which is a really small number of points to try to make an image from. But luckily, as the Earth rotates, we actually obtain other new measurements. So since the projected baselines between the telescopes change as the Earth rotates, this amounts to carving out different elliptical paths in the spatial frequency plane, where when telescopes are close together, that causes you to measure large spatial frequencies, um, uh, um, large spatial structure, sorry, um, low frequencies, large structure. And so to get the fine detail you need to see that ring, you have to put your telescopes uh, as far apart as possible. Okay, so how do we make, uh, how do we uh, get these measurements? Well, we get these measurements by recording hundreds of terabytes of data at each of the different telescope sites. So here you see my friend Lindy Blackburn posing with about half a petabyte of data that we collected at just one of the sites, the LMT telescope in Mexico. And we record so much data that we can't send it over the internet. It's actually flown to a common location. And at that common location, we use a special purpose supercomputer called a correlator to combine the precisely timed data. And then once this is done, this is passed to a calibration stage, which finds weak signals hidden in the correlator output and tunes parameters basically to extract a stronger signal, kind of aligns the phases of the data to extract a stronger signal. Okay, and so once we get these measurements, then our goal is to use them to make an image. And so we have this data, and at this point, we can kind of abstract away the astrophysics of the problem and think of it as purely a mathematical inverse problem. We have sparse data, and our goal is to try to find the image that caused that data, right? And if we were given measurements that covered the entire frequency plane, this would be trivial, because in the case of no noise, you would just simply need to apply an inverse Fourier transform to the measurements. But since we only have a few samples, that means that there's an infinite number of possible images that are perfectly consistent with the data we measure. And on top of that, the fact that there's a different and quickly changing atmosphere above each of the telescopes across the globe actually causes our data to be especially noisy and the problem becomes even more ill-posed. So what does this noise look like? I like to explain a little bit about the structure of the noise and how it enters our system because it informs how we go about doing the reconstruction task and the, and the challenges we had there. So the whole reason that the that VLBI works, is radio interferometry works in the first place is due to the fact that light from the black hole, it's gonna travel to earth for 55 million years and then it's gonna reach one of the telescopes slightly before the other one. And that slight time delay is actually key for extracting the 2D spatial frequency measurements that are used for image reconstruction. But when you have a telescope in Chile and one in Hawaii and one in Spain, they're all gonna have different atmospheres above them. And each atmosphere causes a random delay, a propagation delay in the received signal. And this actually leads to an additional random phase del uh, delay in the frequency measurement we make. And similarly, the atmosphere also causes different attenuation factors in the signal, causing a, a changing absolute gain term. And this error is really challenging because uh, ideally we would measure this nice, beautiful Fourier component, the italicized V here. But in reality, we have a completely random phase error. Uh, you know, that's, and oftentimes our amplitude error is, is pretty bad as well. Um, and so that's pretty terrible because at first glance, we've lost both the amplitude and phase information. And so if you've lost both amplitude and phase, you know, what really do you have left to work with? But luckily, if you look at the measurement term, you notice that there's additional structure to this noise. So you'll notice that these corruption terms are site-based. They occur at every individual telescope, but our measurements come from pairs of telescopes. So that means that if we have a third telescope, then the measurements that are formed with that third telescope share some of the same corrupting terms, G2 and Phi2 here. And so we actually design imaging algorithms that take advantage of this redundant corruption we see across our measurements when solving for our images. So um, for those of you familiar with phase retrieval problems, we're essentially solving a, fa a constrained phase retrieval problem. And to do this, we developed two different kinds of classes of imaging algorithms to tackle the problem. 
the first class of algorithms is based on a very um, a, a traditional standard kind of method used in radio interferometry called clean with an iterative self calibration loop. And this is a, a, a traditional method of making images in the radio astronomy community, which was a huge plus, really important that we got this working on the data because it's well vetted, well understood in the community. But the disadvantage of using these methods is that, you know, they were originally built to work with telescope arrays that were either had more telescopes or uh, were working at frequencies that were easier to calibrate. Um, and so when you are using these methods on the actual EHT data, sometimes um, the, the data is so challenging that sometimes it, the method is so sensitive, you need a significant amount of guidance from a knowledgeable user to kind of guide it towards a good result. So a second a class of methods that we've been developing more recently um, is what we call regularized maximum likelihood methods. And in these methods, we don't try to find an inverse function that takes us directly from the measurements to a picture, but instead we try to find a picture uh, that when we pass it through the forward model of the telescope system, it both fits the measurements and is defined as likely through some sort of image regularizer or prior term. So the disadvantage here is that we have to define what is a likely image, and that is always going to introduce bias. It's always going to push us towards what we think is a likely image. But the huge advantage of these methods is that they can naturally incorporate different types of errors into the image likely uh, into the data likelihood term. And so, for instance, we can even directly optimize an image with data constraints that are insensitive to the kinds of atmospheric errors I just described. And just so to briefly summarize the regular regularized maximum likelihood approach a little bit more, you know, although there are infinite number of solutions that are equally likely in terms of the measurement likelihood that will fit the data equally well of the images that are consistent with the measured data, there are some images that are more likely than others. For instance, we might say the image on the far left is far too noisy and we would prefer maybe a compact image to describe that describes the measurements. And so therefore, our goal becomes to find an image that doesn't just fit the data, but is under also likely under some sort of mathematical model of what, it, what is a likely image. And so using this idea, we incorporate what we call the image prior that essentially scores the images. And by solving for an image that maximizes both the data likelihood and prior, we can whittle down from the infinite possibilities to single one out that we think is a likely image that fits the data well. And we can do this even in the presence of all that crazy noise I talked about. And just because it's gonna come in handy later, I just wanna show mathematically kind of what this looks like. Um, very, so we are solving this optimization problem where we're trying to find an image X here that maximizes the probability, the posterior probability conditioned on the observed measurements Y. So that's all that we're kind of doing. And um, by simply rewriting this using Bayes' rule, we can see that maximizing this log posterior probability is equivalent to maximizing the sum over the data log likelihood and the log image prior. So these are just the two terms that we discussed that kind of balance each other. But notice that when we do image reconstruction, we always have to be cautious. And that's because any imaging method we come up with whether it's a traditional approach or a fancy new machine learning approach, it's always gonna require that we inject some additional information into the problem about what images look like to recover something back in the end. And that's always gonna bias our final picture. For instance, we don't want to even subconsciously have a preference for ring images and then be super excited we recovered a ring back in the end. So that meant a big question we faced in dealing with the M87 data was not only how to make an image, but also how do we verify that what we are reconstructing with our algorithms is actually real. And we tackled this question through a multi-step process. In the first step, in order to avoid shared human bias and, um, and also to assess common features among independent reconstructions, we actually split ourselves into teams. So we split about 40 people who worked on imaging into four teams that uh, span the earth and these four teams were actually not able to talk to each other at all during the initial imaging process. So once we received the M87 black hole data from the uh, correlation and calibration team, we went off with our individual teams and we actually worked in isolation with our, with our uh, respective teams, trying to make our best image from the data for seven weeks. 
And then after seven weeks, we all gathered together and we revealed the images to one another. One another. And this is what we ended up seeing. So this was really amazing because although each picture was different, they, actually, they all reconstructed the same kind of basic structure, this ring of roughly 40 micro arc seconds that's brighter on the bottom than the top. And doing this test and seeing this blind imaging test and seeing these images uh, that resulted from it brought a whole other level of confidence to our results because we found the same structure no matter what method or person reconstructed the data. And so each you know, person and method has its own different biases, but despite those different biases, we all kind of converged to this, although on a pixel level, the images are different, the same message came across. We found this ring. And so, you know, okay, so we were really excited about that. But although this procedure helped us avoid shared human bias, we still wanted to make sure that we weren't subconsciously imposing human bias still on our images. We didn't, you know, maybe we all still wanted to see that ring image. And so we were all pushing it to get that result. So to try to, to, to account for this, we spent the next couple of months essentially trying to break our images. And that led to the second step where we tried to objectively choose image parameters to remove humans from the loop as much as possible. And to do this, we developed three different types of imaging pipelines. You can actually download these pipelines along with the, um, the real M87 data online. So you can run these methods yourself, develop your own new approaches, uh, improve ours. Um, but all of these different pipelines that we developed, um, they're, you, they have their own individual hyperparameters that are associated with them. So each method is designed to have like these kind of sets of knobs. And these knobs are usually tuned by a human user to work on different kinds of data sets. But instead of having a human tune them, we instead wanted to search for the best set of knob settings to recover different kinds of source structures and then see how those different choices affected the result that we got in the end for M87. So for instance, we generated synthetic data as if the event horizon telescope were actually seeing a disk on the sky, on the sky that had no hole in the center. And then we found the best set of parameters to recover this disk shape. Then when we transferred these exact parameters onto the actual M87 data, we found that although we had tried our hardest to try to find parameters that would recover a disk with no hole in the center, our algorithms required us still to put a hole when we were using them on the real data with the same parameter settings. And so by doing this simple training and testing procedure on many different kinds of underlying sources, we saw that our methods always preferred this ring shape and that was true no matter the day we observed M87 on or the imaging code we used to reconstruct it. And by blurring the images then from different imaging pipelines to an equivalent resolution, we then averaged them to form the image that we showed uh, the rest of the world last year. This ring of light uh, surrounding the black hole, roughly 40 micro arc seconds in size and brighter on the bottom than the top. So once we had made these images, though, we still weren't sure. We still wanted to make sure that we weren't trying to impose that ring structure in some way. And so we went through a number of different validation tests. We, we did a lot of these. I'm only going to talk very briefly about one of them, but you can look in our, our papers for the additional tests and details that we did. But the one I'm going to highlight is that I, I talked earlier about how we selected a set of parameters, beta, that performed well on synthetic data. But why should we, there only be one parameter that we consider? In fact, by doing large parameter surveys, we found that there are often many parameters that perform reasonably well on synthetic data. And so instead of just selecting one set of betas, we instead set some sort of threshold and we found all the beta parameters that performed above this threshold on the synthetic data. So for example, for the Event Horizon Telescope Imaging Pipeline, we ran tens of uh, hundreds of thousands of different simulations, and we found about 1500 parameter settings that we deemed acceptable. So for example, here is a slice of two of the parameters that we searched over in one of the surveys. The green boxes show a selection of images that we identified as reasonable through tests on the different synthetic data. And then once we had this set of images, uh, the 1500 for the EHT imaging survey, the set of images for M87, we could look across them for variations. So for instance, 
we align these images and could look at the standard deviation. The standard deviation tells us where there were variations across the different images. And you'll see along this ring, there are areas that we have more uncertainty in. For instance, on the bottom, you see these three knot regions. But if you look at the amplitude of the standard deviation versus the amplitude of the flux along that ring, you'll see it's a very small in comparison. So if you look at the fractional standard deviation, you'll see that we have tons of, we have lots of certainty in the ring structure. It appears in basically all our reconstructions, but what we don't believe is all that wispy structure on the outside. So don't believe all that stuff. Um, okay, so now we have been able to really build confidence in this ring structure. Um, but our goal then is really to use this image to extract science. Um, so can we characterize uncertainty of image features that lead then to science deliverables? For instance, we used simple methods to recover, for instance, the ring diameter. Um, and we do this by taking all those recovered images, uh, we, we um, computed in those parameter surveys, and then extracted the diameters from them. And com by comparing the diameters that we obtained from different images with different beta parameters and across different days, we found that we, we also got a very consistent parameter of the ring diameter of around 40 to 42 micro arc seconds that we believe is the size of this ring with pretty high confidence. And so this is another way that we can become confident in not only that we have this ring structure, but also that we are getting a consistent ring structure. But I want to strongly highlight that what we're doing here is we're probing different modeling choices and seeing how that affects our results, right? The beta is changing modeling choices. And so this is just seeing how we're affected by our model. So in the re regularized maximum likelihood problem, we were essentially changing something like our prior term, what is our model of a likely image, and then seeing how this choice in the prior affected our results. And that's definitely something that is important to explore because we do have uncertainty in what that prior should be. But it's important to note that this is not a posterior distribution. So going forward, it's not talking about uncertainty due to our data. And so going forward, it would be great if we could efficiently explore uncertainty, not only due to the prior, but also due to the data fit. In other words, we would love to be able to sample from our posterior distribution directly. Uh, so given some fixed uh, prior assumption, we want to see what samples from our posterior look like and see how that is affecting our conclusions and our results. But okay, how should we do that? How should we go about sampling from this posterior directly? Well, one natural approach would be to use a, some sort of sampling framework like a Monte Chain Monte Carlo method. And we have done some of this. So for instance, we didn't just estimate the diameter of the ring from recovered images, but we also fit crescent or ring models directly to the data. And so this is a simulation showing an optimization of a, a nested sampling framework where it is trying to fit a simple crescent model to the data. And when you do this, we actually got also a ring diameter of about 40 to 42 micro arc seconds, which was very consistent with the imaging. But on top of that, we also get a posterior over these ring parameters, which is really helpful to understand our uncertainty. However, this is only fitting a few parameters to the ring. And it becomes very challenging to scale this up to capturing posteriors of images that are very high dimensional. So really these methods don't scale right now. And so to tackle this, we've been developing new methods for efficient posterior exploration by exploiting uh, deep learning machinery. And so this is a little bit of an aside from the main M87 story, but I just kind of wanted to show you some recent work going on in my group that I'm excited about, about, you, about efficient posterior exploration. You know, so bear with me and maybe some of you also in the audience will have problems that you can apply a similar approach to. And if so, I'd love to, if you reached out and got in touch with me, I'd love to chat more. Okay, so in the past few years, We've witnessed there's this great success of deep generative models in computer vision. Um, for instance, maybe you have seen some of these, for instance, and these work by giving enough training examples, we can train a neural network that takes an image of just noise, random noise, and it outputs a picture that looks like a real image at first glance. And by plugging in different noise images, you actually generate different output pictures. 
And these deep generative models do a scarily good job at generating realistic looking images. For instance, you can log into www.whichfacesreal.com and try to guess which image is fake and which is a real one. And although there are some artifacts that you might be able to pick up on, it's actually pretty amazing how realistic these images look. So here's one that tricked me. It actually is the left one here that's the real image. And so why am I telling you about this? Well, these deep neural networks define an implicit distribution over the space of images. And these impressive results just, show, just indicate that these networks can learn very flexible and expressive distributions that can capture complex correlations in pixels. And so inspired by these generative models, um, my postdoc Hassan has been developing, has been leading the development of an approach to sample from a posterior distribution using a learned generative neural network. So our goal is to learn the weights theta here of a neural network such that if you pass different random input noise to the neural network, then the output of the neural network will be an image where that image is equivalent to being a sample from an image reconstruction posterior distribution. And so different input noise is gonna result in different posterior sample images. Essentially, the neural network is just learning a mapping from a noise distribution to a posterior distribution. Okay, so how should we go about training this network? Well, unlike in the case of a face generator, we don't have a training set of images to use. If we did, if we had a training set of samples from the image reconstruction posterior, then we would be done, right? Because there would be no need to learn a neural network to generate posterior samples if we already have those samples. And so, okay, let's walk through what we might wanna do. How might we wanna be able to structure this so that we can recover samples from the posterior? Okay, um, so let's define a loss that we can use to optimize the weights. Uh, remember the weights are called theta here of the network. And we wanna find a neural network that every time we sample a new image from it, so we pass in random noise and we get it out, it spits out an image, Every time that new image spits out um, from the, the network, the posterior probability of that sample is high, conditioned on the observed measurements Y. In other words, we wanna minimize the expected neg log likelihood, neg log posterior of our neural network samples. And simply rewriting this using Bayes' rule, we once again see how we can split that posterior into a data likelihood term and an image prior term, just like in our regularized maximum likelihood approach that I talked about earlier. And so, you know, this is all very similar to the regularized maximum likelihood optimization problem. Just now we are taking an expectation over image samples rather than just solving for one image. So we have a network that produces an image and we want on average that the posterior is high. And so the optimization problem has not changed at all from what I just showed above. It's not just written in terms of likelihoods and priors similar, similar to the regularized maximum likelihood. And okay, this kind of makes sense. You know, this is gonna solve for a network that produces images that have high posterior likelihood. That's cool, but there's a catch. And that's that this is not going to sample from the posterior. It's, it actually, it's only gonna to collapse to a single, a single deterministic solution. Why is that? Well, it's gonna just find network weights to always produce the exact same image, the image that scores best under this loss. And that's not what we want because it's not capturing the uncertainty in our reconstruction. So what should we do? Well, it turns out that in order to learn the distribution of all possible reconstructed images, we found that through a very simple proof, you simply need to include a term here, an entry fee term to encourage diversity in the samples that are generated by the neural network. And so we can just add this additional term here at the end that's just trying to increase the entropy of the distribution. And this prevents the network from collapsing to producing only a single image since it wants to make sure that the neural network image, distri in image distribution has entropy. 
Okay, so what I've said here might sound pretty hacky, but actually this solution actually has solid mathematical foundation. Um, it actually is uh, upon convergence supposed to approximate the posterior distribution. And the way you can show is briefly speaking, it's a specific kind of variational Bayesian method. In variational methods, we define a simple family of density functions. For instance, Q theta here is visualized by the blue space, uh, the, by this blue sphere is kind of the space of possible distributions that we, uh, that we can explore. And then we solve an optimization problem to find the parameters theta star that best match the target posterior distribution. But then the question becomes, you know, what should this family of distributions be? Well, traditionally in, in variational Bayesian methods, they're typically pretty simple because you need to be able to solve integrals by efficiently that efficiently evaluate probabilities. And so using simple distribution families like Gaussian distributions is typically what is done. But these are often pretty far from the real distribution. But by using a particular type of neural network called a flow phase network, we can actually define a very flexible space of distributions still parameterized by theta, which is those network weights. And this flexible family of distributions can better capture the image posterior distributions we're interested in targeting. And so, you know, all really this neural network is doing here is it's just giving us flexibility that we didn't have before with the simple variational methods. And this allows us to get much closer, closer to faithfully approximating samples from a well-defined posterior distribution. So we've tested this approach in multiple cases. Due to time, I'm just gonna talk very briefly about a couple of them that I find instructive. So here is an example. On the top is a synthetic image of a black hole um, and the same image blurred to the resolution we expect to achieve with our radio telescope. So this is fake data here. We took uh, this image and we generated synthetic data from it as if the Event Horizon Telescope were seeing this distribution of flux on the sky. And then using this mock data set, we ran our, regular, our typical regularized maximum likelihood methods to see what result we got. And we noticed that every time we ran the method with slightly different initialization, we would recover different results. In some images, the bright spot was on the top right. And in some cases, the bright spot was on the bottom left. And it appeared that both modes actually fit the data pretty well. So it was very unclear of what was the true image. Well, we tested our deep probabilistic imaging approach on this data to learn an approximate posterior distribution. And on the bottom right here are some samples that we obtained by putting in different noise to the neural network actual after it's learned and to see what, what it learned were samples from the posterior distribution. And you can see that our learned network, it was able to capture a posterior distribution that also indicates there was two modes of possible solutions in our data. And by embedding our images into a two-dimensional space, we can see that most of our neural network samples actually clustered into these two modes with their mean and variance shown to the right of each clustered mode. And this, the distributions of data fitting loss for, for the images in each mode show that Although it can be difficult to tell which image is correct by just inspecting the statistics of a single image, if you analyze the histogram of statistics for each mode, it becomes more clear which mode is more likely to correspond with the true image. In this case, it turned out mode two uh, did look to, to fit the data better on average, which just happened to look more like the truth. But perhaps the most interesting is what happens when we run it on some real data. So this is the result we got when we ran this new uh, approach on the real M87 black hole data. And what I find really encouraging is that if you compare the standard deviation in the resulting images to the standard deviation we published earlier, you can say they're amazingly similar. So although these standard deviation maps actually represent slightly different things, one is the uncertainty due to the underlying model and the optimization procedure, and the other is uncertainty due to the data fit, they're still comparable. In both uncertainty maps, there's these three regions with the highest uncertainty that seem to match up. And so this was really exciting to me when I saw this result, since this was the very, since Ha actually got this result the very first time he ran the data on the real M87 data. And he got a, a result that was the same, close to the same that it took a whole group months to basically achieve before, which will hopefully speed up analysis of our uncertainty estimation in the future. 
And so I'm really excited to be making progress on methods like this that will allow us to better understand and, and um, a results in, in, in future data sets and in, in more challenging data sets as well. But now let's get back to N87. So, you know, from many different angles, we've recovered that this image is this ring of light and we're pretty, we're very confident in this ring structure. And this image tells us so much about the immediate environment around the black hole. But perhaps one of the most amazing things is that by comparing this picture to simulations scientists have made for years, we find that the image that we've taken is amazingly consistent with a number of these predictions. And at the end of the day, really the biggest thing we recovered, you know, we can talk about the mass that we recover and, and information about how the gas is spinning, but really at the end of the day, the biggest thing is we recovered a ring. And that is something now that might seem obvious, but that was an ultimate question. We didn't know what we would see. Okay, but you might notice though, the simulation I just showed, it was moving. So is our recovered image of M87 also moving? And it turns out, in fact, it is. So another interesting thing is that if you string together the images we recovered of M87, so we, we actually observed M87 over the course of a week. Uh, there were two days closer to the beginning and two days closer to the end. And if you, we independently imaged each of those and you can string them together to a movie. And if you play them, you might notice there's actually some variation, some evolution there in the images. So I'll, I'll play it for you here. Okay, it's really tough to see. So I'm gonna play it again. You'll might notice that it moved, the bright spot moves a little bit more from the left down to the bottom, I would say. So I'll play it again. Okay, so we don't know exactly what this evolution is caused by, whether it's material rotating or just kind of filaments getting brighter and dimmer. But what we are sure of is that the black hole is evolving. And that's because it appears in the raw measurements we take. And actually getting a hold on a black hole's time variability is quite important for a number of reasons. It doesn't only give us a window into the dynamics around a black hole and hopefully an understanding of how uh, black holes accrete a, a matter and how their powerful jets are formed, but it also is going to, it helps us in mapping the space time of a black hole and in constraining our prediction of general relativity even further. But actually the black hole in M87 is not the only black hole we're interested in imaging to get a handle on the question of time variability. In the heart of our own Milky Way galaxy, 26,000 light years away from us, there's this cluster of stars. And by peering past all the galactic dust with infrared telescopes, astronomers have mapped the path of this cluster of stars over decades. And by tracking the motions of the stars over time, astronomers have concluded that the only thing small and dense enough to, have co to cause this motion is actually a supermassive black hole. In fact, this discovery led to the Nobel Prize in Physics just given weeks ago for the work of Andrea Ghez, actually a Caltech alum, and Reinhard Genzel for the discovery of a supermassive compact object in the center of our galaxy, otherwise known as Sagittarius A star. So as awesome as M87 has been, Sagittarius A star, or Sag A star for short, might be able to help us better answer these questions. Sag A star is teeny tiny compared to M87. M87 is six and a half billion solar masses. Sag A star is a measly four million solar masses. But because it's so much closer to us, it appears about the same size in the sky. Um, but because it is so small, that means the gas can orbit around it much more quickly. So whereas it takes four to 30 days for gas to make a complete orbit around M87, for Sag A star, it can make a full orbit of gas every four to 30 minutes. And so we would like to be able to uh, image the time variations of Sag A star. And to do that, we have been developing methods to try to recover not just static images from the data, but full movies. But if you thought recovering a static image was a hard ill post problem, this is orders of magnitude more challenging because we have the same amount of data, but now we have to solve for all the pixels in a full movie rather than just a single frame. And so as important as it is to continue pushing on the algorithmic approaches to squeeze more out of the data we've already collected, it's also important to realize that to extract more science, we have to think about improving not just algorithms, but also our instrument that collects the data to begin with. And so to help us better take a better picture, we're trying to design the next generation array, which expands our network of telescopes from six different locations on Earth. And we've already begun building out our array to get more data. 
adding telescopes in Greenland, France, Arizona. And the one I'm most excited about is we recently got NSF funding to add a telescope at Caltech's Owens Valley Radio Observatory. So with the help of Vikram Ravi, Greg Hallinan, and uh, the amazing staff at Overo uh, and others at Caltech, um, Caltech is actually being part of the EHT telescope. But imagine what we could do if we added even 10 more telescopes. Well, maybe we could make a video of the gas falling into the black hole in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. And being able to do this would be a huge scientific gold mine. But before we just plop down a bunch of telescopes, we have to be really careful. Building a new telescope is expensive, at least millions, but usually tens of millions of dollars. And so we should try to optimize to find the locations that are gonna give us the biggest bang for our buck. And so that leads to the last part of my talk today on using machine learning methods for optimal telescope design. So how should we go about solving for the location of telescopes in the next generation array? Well, typically the design of sensors are idealized and considered independently from the image reconstruction problem. And in doing so, many assumptions are made. For instance, when you're designing where to put telescopes, you might ignore the nonlinearities in the system or complexities of the noise. And especially for problems where data is so correlated and noise is so challenging, like the Event Horizon Telescope, it's a huge missed opportunity to not consider these effects. And so because the problems of image reconstruction and telescope design are so intimately related, we really should be trying to optimize them jointly. And so how should we go about solving this? Well, if you rearrange the blocks in this diagram, you'll notice that it looks very similar to what is called an autoencoder, where the sensing system is the encoder that produces the measurements or codes, and the imaging algorithm is the decoder that makes the image. And deep encoders, where the encoder and decoder are neural networks, are often used for image compression. And so by solving for the weights of a neural network, that encodes the picture in a small number of measurements at the same time as a network that decodes those measurements into an image, you can also, you can often figure out compression schemes that do much better than hand designed techniques. In the reconstruction problem, you could use an arbitrary mathematical function that takes you from the measurements to an image for the reconstruction. It just needs to be something that we can code up in a computer. So we could use a neural network for a decoder to make the image from the measurements. But unlike a generic deep encoder, sensing systems that we build must obey physical constraints. And so we can't use an arbitrary neural network for the encoder. So how do we make sure that we can learn, that we learn something that we can actually build? We can't go out there and build some random mathematical function. We wanna make sure that it's actually something physical. And so Ha has also been leading this effort in my group. And the approach that we proposed is to develop a physics constrained encoder that can train with the decoder end to end to optimize both simultaneously. And so let's zoom in to see how we do that. Well, okay, so we have some input image. Here I'm calling the input image Z. We can define a forward model of the measurements that we'd expect to collect. In this example, we pretend we have three possible telescopes to sample from, color-coded by blue, red, and green, and we indicate the measurements that have come from those telescopes as the colored dots. And these measurements can be complicated, nonlinear, correlated, noisy, what, what have you. You just define an arbitrarily difficult, uh, complicated forward model. And here we're showing all these possible samples. And so we can pass all these possible samples off as collected measurements, but that means to, to make an image, but that means that we'd actually have to build all of those telescopes to make those measurements. So our goal is to choose among them to find the best to build. And to do that, we introduce a sensor sampling distribution that characterizes the probability that we wanna sample from a particular telescope. So we sample telescopes from this distribution, and then we mask out measurements that were not produced by those telescopes. And so now just the red and blue dots remain. And every time we sample from this probability distribution, we might sample different combinations of telescopes and obtain different observed measurements. And, every, and then once we have this subset of measurements, they're passed on to the image reconstruction decoder um, to decode them into recovering an image. 
So we can string all the pieces together into a single differentiable neural network. It's just a single optimization function that's differentiable with trainable blocks highlighted here in red. And our ultimate goal is to use this network to learn an optimal probability distribution of which telescopes are likely to be the best to build. And we do that by maximizing the similarity between the input and output image. We want to make sure the output looks like the input. Uh, we also have a loss that says uh, for sensor sparsity, because we want to reduce the number of telescopes we build. So let's try to penalize building too many telescopes. And then we add a term for sampling diversity that basically tries to explore the space of possibilities to make sure we haven't missed an array design that would uh, be that would perform just as well or not better. And then we learn the sensor sampling uh, distribution parameters during end to end training. So we're learning the distribution of which telescopes are most important simultaneously with the image reconstruction method. And so what is the sensor sampling, sampling distribution exactly? Well, we model our sensor sampling distribution as what we call a binary fully connected icing model. If you don't know what that is, no problem. Basically, it's just a joint distribution over on and off states of different telescopes that is parameterized by two parameters. One is that we call the site activity, which is basically how important is it that I turn this one telescope on irrespective of all the others, kind of like a marginal probability distribution of each telescope. And the other um, characterizes site correlations, which indicates if I turn a particular telescope on, is it better for another one to turn on or off? Why would you want another telescope to turn off? Well, to save resources, right? We want to be able to find the smallest set of telescopes that performs well. And the end-to-end -end training then searches for these parameters here, theta. So here is an example of a telescope distribution we have learned. The IC model parameters theta jj, which talk about site activity uh, um, or importance of a single telescope are shown on the left. And then the model parameters uh, theta j k on the right quantify those correlations between telescopes where red represents positive correlations and blue represents negative correlations. And from the recovered distributions, we can see some patterns we'd expect to see. For instance, in the case of uncorrelated noise, in many cases, the co-located telescopes are heavily penalized from sampling together. And that makes sense because if you don't have any noise, they're just sampling the exact same measurement. So why would you waste your resources to build another telescope at the same site in the case that you have no noise? But my favorite is the things that we would, uh, ex uh, not that the things that we'd expect to see, but the things that we don't know what to expect. So for instance, by changing the different types of noise we train on, we can also see how this affects our results, how this affects how we should build our array. For instance, this result is with purely Gaussian thermal noise included on the measurements. But when we include the difficult atmospheric phase air that plagues our measurements, the array preferences actually fairly, change fairly drastically. And so notice that when I flip back and forth, the correlations have changed. And so we find that this is a way of telling us about the structures and the geometry of the network array that are preferred in the case of that challenging, these challenging data correlations. And complicated and correlated noise is not something that people can easily consider analytically. And so I'm really excited that we're able to handle these much more arbitrarily complicated models now and learn from them. So using this approach, we're starting to understand where we may be wanting to place the next ground-based telescopes to reveal more of the unseen. And I'm also really excited that we soon may be able to apply it to a variety of other scenarios, including even the optimal placement of telescopes in space which is part of an ongoing KISS workshop, a study that is, was hosted here at Caltech with collaborators from Caltech, JPL, and all around the world. And so hopefully by jointly improving our sensing system and our reconstruction methods, optimizing them simultaneously, we may be able to see even more. And so to close, it's clear we have learned a lot from this image of the black hole Im uh, image of M87 already. But what I hope I also got across today is that we're really just at the beginning and now that we have this new extreme laboratory of gravity, we're, we're thinking of all the ways towards the future in ways we can improve our instrument and algorithms, improve them jointly uh, to learn even more. And so hopefully one day, not to show you a static image of a black hole, but a movie of a black hole as gas is uh, slowly uh, falling towards its event horizon. So with that, I wanna thank the amazing team uh, of collaborators I have the opportunity to work with on a daily basis. 
There are far too many to name, but in addition to Ha, who led the machine learning developments I spoke about today, I especially want to thank all the early career collaborators who are often behind the scenes, but had done most a lot of the hard work to make the project a success. So I'm showing here some of those that were recognized with the early career and PhD thesis awards for the first M87 results. And working together across different continents on aspects of this project spanning from instrumentation to theory uh, really made uh, this project a success and hopefully we'll continue to make it a success in developing the next generation of this telescope and future results. And so with that, thank you. And I look forward to answering any questions you have. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I guess we can get you first. And I guess others who wanna raise their hands and ask their questions directly can also. Um, First of all, in the chat, Katie, there is a question. Um, do you need to maintain an absolute phase reference between the different telescopes? And how do you achieve that? So we uh, so we have to know the location, we have to know roughly the location of our source, but we don't have a phase referencing, uh, the precise phase referencing. So that is also one reason we um, we have to solve for the phase, both in the correlation. Uh, in calibration stages to align the phases, uh, but also in the imaging. So actually when we're doing the imaging of uh, the M87 image, the image can be uh, actually um, reconstructed in any kind of location on the field of view that we're uh, allowing it to search over. So we don't have uh, absolute phase that across the different um, sites. Okay, another question. How many black holes have been, detect have been detected in the Milky Way galaxy? Uh, I don't, so I don't know how many stellar uh, uh, mass uh, uh, black holes there are. Um, a, few we're ten, in a, few, a few tens or so, I think, is the approximate answer. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> so we're, the EHD, though, really has no hope of seeing stellar mass black holes. We're really uh, only able to see uh, supermassive, both for size, but also um, I think because the the how bright they are as well. Um, so the only two site, uh, the only two black holes that we believe are big enough that we know of that are big enough on the sky for us to see event horizon scale structure are M87 and Sagittarius A star. That being said, we do image other um, black holes outside of the Milky Way, um, but where we can't see that event, uh, other active galactic nuclei, where we can't see uh, the the um, the, the event horizon scale structure, but we can image the jet set resolutions that we weren't able to see before. Okay, another question in the questions and answers. In the telescope facing problem, you consider second moments only, i.e. theta ij. Is it useful to consider higher order moments? It's a great question. So yeah, um, that was a, a kind of a first, uh, uh, so a first kind of pass at the problem of let's like first model it using this uh, binary IC model that captures the correlations, the second order uh, moment here. But actually you're completely right. Like why not different kinds of correlations? And so we have since then replaced that element with actually a neural network based distribution. Um, so it'll just like in the stuff I talked about earlier where you can capture complex modes of posterior distributions, you can also come, um, capture then complicated uh, different kinds of telescope arrays um, in that way. And although with the limited telescopes, it hasn't made a huge difference in our findings that we know of thus far, but we need to do more analysis. It actually helps in other problems that I didn't talk about today. So for instance, we're applying this technique for like Fourier tachography, microscopy, and things like that, where the second order correlations are not sufficient to do uh, optimizing the sensors that you choose to turn on and off. Great, thanks, uh, Katie. We, we have a question, a hand raised. Um, PMG, would you like to go ahead and answer your question? Oh, sorry. So, PMG, you have your hand raised. If you want to go ahead and unmute. Okay. In the meantime, we, we can go ahead and ask it another question. I think, Lynn, you had your hand raised in Hillenbrand. OK, I think both hands disappeared. So let's move back to the Q&A. The question, um, 
from Matthias. I was curious about the scalability. Is it easily possible to reuse the method for taking photos of other black holes now? Uh, so we do use the same basic structure for uh, imaging the other, uh, the, so the methods that we developed for M87, we do kind of use for imaging um, Sag A star, except for I talked about the fact, uh, so we're currently in the process of doing imaging of Sag A star. Um, but the, as I said, that there are a lot of other challenges with Sagittarius A star that we didn't have in MA7, like the time variability. There's also scattering due to the interstellar medium um, that make it a, challenging to use them to just to blindly apply them. So uh, we either do mod small modifications or develop completely new methods that basically try to model variations, uh, try to model uh, expected motion um, in, in the source. Not, not that we expect the motion, but it, it expects that you would recover motion. Um, and uh, other than that, we also are applying this, these techniques to things that are not black holes. So uh, for instance, there's like radio interferometry is just, you know, that, so many radio images that you've seen, probably most of them that you have seen come from this technique of basically filling in this gaps of, of knowledge. And, this, and there have been techniques that have been developed over decades, these clean and self calibration techniques. And we're also hoping to apply these techniques to those kinds of data as well. Um, so we, you know, we validated through, uh, before we even had the data, we did lots of tests by validating um, and comparing to results on other telescope arrays, for instance, the VLBA, um, the ALMA telescope array um, and, 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 and others. And uh, Greg and, uh, is also, um, also involved in a project that Greg uh, and Vikram are leading, which are another, uh, it's kind of the other side of the problem. There's lots of data there, uh, but the challenge is dealing with so much data, but it's also applying, we're interested in applying similar techniques in, in that problem as well to the radio, DSA 2000 radio camera. Okay, great. Kobe, do we have any uh, raised hands in the uh, attendee list? No, not at the moment. Okay, uh, moving back to the Q&A list, uh, a question. Do you have an estimate for when you will reconstruct a black hole movie? Looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, we're, we're hard at work. Um, as I said, it's a lot, it's more challenging than M87. I can't give like estimated timeline, but I, what I would expect is that it's un, it probably would not be the, first results that we publish of Sagittarius A star. We probably would first publish something that is like what we believe would be an, an average image or, or something that kind of captures the main uh, structure and then follow up later with uh, video reconstructions just because of the fact that the data is so sparse and we want to be very confident in what we publish and, and, and recovering movies uh, are, are very challenging. And so that's part of the reason we're developing this NGEHT so that we are able to recover that information. Okay, the last question in the Q&A here is, can you get a distance, a distance measurement to be any method involving um, EHT or, N or NGEHT? Can we get a distance measurement to the black hole? So mm -hmm. I think all the results are assuming distances that have already, uh, through other studies, uh, uh, um, and you know there are associated air bars and stuff. I'm not, I don't know the details of that, but they're all assuming this distance that has already been published. And based upon that, we can calculate uh, what ex what the expected diameter of that ring is, and if that aligns with uh, what we'd expect. So uh, we do not use that to this image to um, improve distance measurement. What we did do use it to improve is mass measurement of the black hole. So mass to distance is really kind of what you get by the size of the ring. Excellent. And one last big question: the James Webb Space Telescope will it help in any way in how we see black holes? Uh, not that I understand, maybe uh, in other ways, but we need very particular types of telescopes. For here, we're observing at a, a 1.3 millimeter wavelength, 230 gigahertz. Um, and really, um, from the ground, there is only a small range of frequ uh, frequencies, wavelengths that we can use to uh, get past like all the gas around it, uh, pierce through it and see that ring. Um, and it's that also not absorbed by the um, atmosphere. So we really only have this kind of small range. Um, so I don't, uh, we wouldn't be able to connect uh, to James Webb for this. 
All right, great. I think that's our full Q&A sample covered. So um, thank you again, Katie, for an excellent talk and for taking the time to answer all the questions. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Look forward to meeting uh, you, you all more in the PMA department uh, in, uh, in person in the coming year. <laughs> Thanks.